Welcome, thinkers, to Season 4, Episode 14 of Thinking Critically. The thing I want to plug today is my Twitch, as I'm actually recording this and finishing editing this episode while streaming it on twitch.tv slash thinkingcritically. So if you want to see a little bit behind the scenes on the show, perhaps some recording, so that's about as early bird as you can get the episodes, then head over to my stream and you'll find me cut out mistakes like the one I've just made and you're not hearing right now. Uh, <laughs> and all my other little secret hints and tips and tricks to making a one man, one man band podcast. And also, of course, my ongoing homebrew campaign, session 92 by the time this episode comes out on Tuesday. So yeah, head over to twitch.tv slash thinking critically. Otherwise, let's get on with the show. And today I'm joined by Shelley Mazanoble and Greg Tito, the co-hosts of the Dragon Talk podcast. Thank you ever so much for joining us today, guys. Can you tell us a little bit about yourselves? Hi, thank you so much for having us today. I am Shelley Mazanoble. I am the senior brand manager for Dungeons and Dragons. That is my day job. But also, as mentioned, co-host of the official D&D podcast, Dragon Talk, and now co-author of a book about a podcast <laughs> called Dragon Talk, co-authored uh, with the lovely Greg Tito, book called Welcome oh. to Dragon Talk, inspiring conversations about Dungeons and Dragons and the people who love to play it. And now oh. I turn it over to you, my co-host, my co-author and friend. Greg oh, you said I was lovely. <laughs> now I'm, like, uh, I'm so, uh, uh, you know, uh, honored uh, uh, to be on here and talk <laughs> to you, Daniel. Yeah, uh, so yeah, I am Greg Tito. I am the senior communications manager for Dungeons and Dragons. But as part of that, it is getting the word out, making everybody know about what is going on in the Dungeons and Dragons community through Dragon Talk. And Shelly and I have been excited to Go back into our our many many episodes, our three hundred plus interviews that we've done with members of the community, and reflect that back in in book form. So this is uh, really exciting and 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 really great to be able to talk to uh, folks on uh, on podcasts about a podcast about a game and the book that we wrote about those things. <laughs> of course, you know what you need to do next. You need to do a podcast about the book creation process, right? Yeah, we need, oh my yeah. gosh, need to keep, We need to do a TV show about the book. Yes. About about the podcast, about the game. We would love to have a writer's room. That'd be great. Let's do it. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you ever so much again for joining us today. Well, talking of 300 episodes, today's topic is community. So what does that mean to you in the D&D &D and wider TTRPG framework? I'll open the floor to you guys. Well, I think we were looking for a through line for how we were going to approach talking about dragon talk right because we were like oh let's talk about the podcast all these amazing guests that we've had and the thing that kind of coalesced i don't think this was necessarily a big part of our book proposal shelly but it was something that kind of we thought of over time that was like this is not obviously it's about the podcast it's about the game and the history of it but to me it became a history of the dungeons and dragons community and the people around this game and how it has progressed and changed over the you know, 40 plus years that it has been around. And to me, that means anybody who is, uh, you know, the, the D and D community means anybody who has interacted with the game and played it, you know, so either just around their table and, you know, um, shared it with their, their own community, whether it's their, their, their family, their church, their community center, their school, uh, or just their friend group. And then uh, beyond that, the larger D and D community of those smaller sub communities communicating with each other. And that only really <laughs> occurred back in the early days, face to face at conventions or through mail correspondence or on magazines. But like what's interesting is tracing that history throughout those decades to how uh, the internet has changed, how communities gather and get together and share what they do and the creativity that comes not just from being inspired by Dungeons and Dragons, because there is tons of, images and storytelling and things within the pages of D&D books that inspire people, but how the community inspires each other and how they 
see the maps, the cosplay, the the live shows, the podcasts that people are creating around Dungeons and Dragons, and those reflections start creating, you know, com- uh, communication with each of those places. And then that's to me is the definition of a community. Is like it's almost like a, a if you had a beam of light that was bouncing around a mirrored circular room it would just keep bouncing around mm-hmm. and creating more beautiful kaleidoscopes of of a light show. I don't know. I kind of lost it in that metaphor there. But you know what I'm trying to say. It's beautiful. Oh, I see it. I see it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and what about yourself, Shelley? So what I what community and the world of D&D to me is something that really stood out early on when I started to become more involved in it was this is a very supportive group of people. Now, I come mm. from uh, the world of college theater, <laughs> and I always like to make this comparison. That was like cutthroat. We did not want more uh, creators coming into that space. We didn't want more competition. You didn't. You should be collaborating, but you didn't want to collaborate because you didn't want somebody to be better. Like whatever. I. This is partially why I, I did not end up pursuing theater after college, <laughs> but. The D&D world, also comprised of a lot of theater majors, I shall say. However, there are lots of cosplayers, lots of streamers, lots of podcasters, lots of game designers, lots of people doing a lot of the same work in the same space. And yet, I found it so incredible to see how these people were lifting each other up, were like commenting on like, oh my gosh, your cosplay, amazing and sharing other people's work from the same space that you're also working in. And I think that part of that is because when you play D&D, you just become very used to being part of a team of recognizing that you're all just better together and that there's room for everybody here. Like we want people in your party that can can help lift you up and support you and play a specific role. Like you, you want the best of the best in there. And to see how people who didn't know each other were suddenly like inviting each other to be part of their streams. And all like I would see like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize these people actually knew each other. Like several past Dragon Talk guests. I'm like, now look at them. Now they're playing a stream. Oh my gosh, they've invited this person to be a guest. These two are doing this amazing cosplay together. Or like these two creators are now working on D and D adventure content together. It's truly amazing to see how this community really feels inspired by the work that each other is doing, and how they find ways to continue to partner with each other or elevate each other's voices. And to me, I find that to be really, really inspiring, and just one of the best parts about being in this community. It's a true community. It really is. Mm. Absolutely. Thank you very much for those. I couldn't agree more. And it's made me self reflect on the last several years of my life, <laughs> pushing a decade at this point of, of since joining the D&D community. And it, it started from me shouting up the stairs to my housemate saying, do you want to do this Dungeons and Dragons thing maybe <laughs> at some point? And him po- poking his head around the banisters and being like, Hell yeah. And then now here we find ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> it's like oh, that, that gift of the guy no. who's eating noodles and he's like, I got you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's, that was literally it. Yeah, that was that was the seed. And then I here we it. are, however many years later. And from joining games and being brought into games and with, with a bunch of strangers. And uh, uh, that same guy, he invited me to a game with um, him and his colleagues. I was like, okay, yeah, fine. I'll take it. It's great in person. Love it. Uh, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm flattered. And I turned up to this guy's house, hoping that my friend would be there as a social lubricant, and he he didn't. So I was just like, mm. ding dong, uh, oh, it's just the two of us. I'm here at your house, random stranger to play D&D. D&D. Uh, but luckily, we still play with that that group two, three years later. And that's one of uh, one example of that kind of the community that it fosters. And now those guys are like my super, super close friends. So I'm, I'm very happy with that. Yeah. Yeah, that's what we found is that people who play this game together form a bond that mm. is not typical in everything else, right? Like, cause if you go and like do a pickup game of basketball, you're not going to be like, Oh yeah, buddy. Remember that time you made that shot, uh, <laughs> you know, three years ago. <laughs> remember that, that assist game? you gave me that? Was right. Cool. Like, no one does that. But <laughs> in D and D you can probably not even see that same group again and be like, Oh, remember when we killed that, you know, that ogre mm. chieftain who, you know, like the, 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 the memories that you share together, are so much more visceral 
but also at the same time not real, which is fantastic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, you know, you'll have that bond forever. And you know, that's why when you go to conventions now, you still hear people who have been playing for decades and they will rattle off stories of the dragons they slayed and the and the adventures they went on and how that was so formative for them. And that's the 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 stitches that tie this whole community together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I was doing my homework this week. As a good podcast, I should <laughs> having uh, <laughs> having my, my guests on this Friday, and I, I was looking through your obviously your your back catalogue of episodes, and there's uh, yeah a couple of names in there just tying into what you you were you guys were chatting about earlier on about uh, you know lifting each other up and and seeing how other people move around in the community. I was like, oh yeah, like uh, the one I noticed was uh, Lucas Zellers from Making a Monster. He's yeah we. we we got on very well. He's been on the show twice already. Very well received episodes. No, no pressure, you two. Um, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> like when I saw that, I was like, oh, awesome! I, Lucas is great, and I'm I'm super stoked that he's <laughs> you know had that opportunity and stuff. So people that such as yourselves that I've not even met in in person, you know, unfortunately through this through the screen to have that kind of you know immediate response to their their success is 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 just a nice <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to to be uh, be able to partake in in those kinds of circles <laughs> yeah see you're happy for your friends yes community. <laughs> yeah lifting them and, up and it's not to say like there is no like infighting or like everybody's just hearts and roses everybody mm. gets along all the time like I'm, but it, there is a tremendous amount though of collaboration that happens here that i just don't see happening in other mm. communities yeah and and having maybe maybe i'm in a unique position or not oh well similar to yourselves and that there's several guests on every week and i've been exceptionally fortunate to have people like lucas on and have made bonds with those people again people i've never would have yeah. met otherwise from other completely different walks of life completely different demographics completely different parts all over the world as well to then have this this network is of the shared love for a hobby is is cool yeah. like and that's what i've loved about how it's changed over the last decade right like i mm. think that other people have observed this we've talked about it a bunch on dragon talk but just the idea that being able to communicate over thousands of miles uh through you know what started with forum posts and then with social media and then through actual video and content production has i think tightened those bonds between people uh so that it wasn't just like oh you can be famous in in uh peoria indiana for having <laughs> a great D D game and only people in peoria would know that like now people beyond your uh you know country borders you're you know around the world can see you know if you yeah. put it online and just how amazing those those stories that you can tell with that community and that's what i love is that it is it's become truly a, a global community Mm -hmm. through that yeah yeah so just thinking back to your first game dan when you wanted your friend to be there because you said you needed you wanted him to be the social lubricant but little oh, yes. did you know D and D is actually the social lubricant it, it is actually. new tagline <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the snippet of today's show thank you very much you're only like 10 minutes in <laughs> but yes it is but it, it does act as that you you immediately have that bond together for for mm -hmm. sharing in this hobby, mm -hmm. and that's been really interesting. So then, when we talk to educators or or uh, therapists, how they use D and D in that realm, right? So like that's always fascinating yeah. to us is that you know, we're calling it a social lubricant, but it is the the framework for how people get together and uh, communicate. They may not have those rules and those things set up in their lives or, or, or how their specific brain chemistry works. Right. And so D and D can provide that for folks who may not be able to get it anywhere else. And I think that also creates a sense of community where, you know, especially kids, but all people who are neurodivergent have a, a place to be a place where they can be on an, mm. on a more equal footing than the uh, neurotypical people in their lives. Right. And so that's, that's, I love that it's, it's not only helping people who are, I don't want to say mainstream, but people who are, you know, already a part of mm -hmm. a larger community, but people who can't find community in other places, they can find it here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I mentioned it before on the show, uh, but I was on a, we were a weekend away in Brighton in, in England and we'd gone into one of our friendly local gaming stores out there for the board games and, and whatnot. And they had a big gaming area and we went out and it was 3.30, 4 in the afternoon and there was a group of school kids still in their uniform with an adult DMing a game for them and they're like 
clambering up on the table and you know <laughs> shouting at each other and like slamming dice down and i was like oh man that seems like so much fun <laughs> <laughs> i want to do that <laughs> they haven't yeah they're having the time of their life and uh, that's, that's you know I, I didn't have that opportunity when i was their age so i was like that's that's so cool i'm super stoked for those kids <laughs> yes me too i love to hear that so obviously you you guys have had an awful lot of guests and uh, therefore have a very wide net when it comes to that wider community i wanted to ask then as this is a unique question for yourselves what would you say is the one discussion you guys have had when you've been interacting with the community that has either really really stood out and i'm, I'm using my politician words here not say not to say best uh but has <laughs> stood out because <laughs> people have asked me who's my favorite guest and i'm like i'm not answering that come on right uh, no <laughs> no <laughs> so yeah what what or, or that's really taken you back as that's come out of left field or sideswiped you was like whoa i didn't even realize that was a, a thing that was happening in the D mm. community is, is more where i want to take that question so when writing this book welcome to dragon talk it is a collection of essays that are inspired by past dragon talk interviews and greg and i had a pretty difficult time trying to pare down just what we came up with what 29 essays out of like at the time of starting this book, maybe five years of history. But mm -hmm. for a weekly yeah. podcast, that's a lot of interviews. So it was um, it was a challenge, but there were some that definitely rose to the top, either because it was just something, a topic that really connected with one of us, or we learned something about ourselves <laughs> during that interview that we did not know. Or like you said, people were doing some really cool, innovative things with Dungeons and Dragons that we had not been aware of before and i think both greg and i also have a type of interview like the, the things that like we both just get really excited about and for me it was more general of how teachers use D, &D in classrooms and how therapists use D, &D in, in therapy similar to what greg had been touching on before but i was really surprised and so excited to learn i guess that I'm thinking about Cade Wells. I guess he was one of the first educators that we had on the show. And this was a while ago. And Greg does write about him in the book. But he was one of the first people that we talked to that made us realize, wow, this game is not just fun and entertainment. There are things in this game that are really impacting people in such unique and profound ways. And the way that he was using D&D &D to inspire kids and especially you know at a, a school that was had a lot of challenges a lot of the students were challenged socially emotionally just at, like education mm -hmm. just wasn't a priority for them and then to find that he was using dungeons and dragons with these kids parts of it and then all of a sudden seeing them starting to perform well on tests or actually like pick up a pen and willingly start writing something and it was you know <laughs> mm -hmm. a, a backstory for their character or a little bit of world building for this world that they were deciding that they wanted to create but holy moly to see like this game is actually inspiring people to do great things and the same with therapy and how D, D can actually change people like help them gain social skills like, as greg was saying help them find communities but also helping them feel confident, feel empowered, actually feel what it's like to have control in their lives for the first time. And it's just, it goes so far beyond just a game. And I think that was really impactful, definitely for Greg and I to see that people were doing so much with this game that we are so lucky to come mm. to work every day and, and work on. So that's my type. I like those. <laughs> My type, I think, is more performance-based. I really love uh, entertainers and people who have found some success in their in show business, but then also perhaps tying that back to Dungeons and Dragons or getting to Dungeons and Dragons as a quote-unquote safe way to be creative in a, in a performance way without it, you know, being you know scrutinized by by millions of people, right? Like it's this, the joy that can come from playing D and D. But as far as the one that was the most impactful, I think that you know, honestly, each one of these ones that we chose to write about changed us in some ways. And I think that's what makes these essays so powerful is that they're not really about 
the individuals that we're writing about. I mean, they are, but the ones that came to the forefront were ones that had ways that uh, it, it affected uh, me and Shelly as we were talking through them and how much it changed our understanding. And a lot of that came, and it's a, and it's a topic that is is kind of a through line throughout here, and it's one we've already touched on here, which is uh, the idea of inclusion, like trying to 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 consciously include more people is uh, something that I think Dragon Talk was not even intentionally, but kind of founded on, right? Like we, we, we were always about like, oh yeah, let's just bring in more people that do different fun things with uh, dragon talk. And that was, you know, on its face, just trying to get and book more interviews, but also <laughs> by doing so, we ended up having a thesis statement, which is that we want everybody to play this game for all the reasons that Shelly just outlined in talking through uh, uh, people who are marginalized. Like there's so much benefit people can get from playing this being a part of that community and, and and feeling like they are included, right? And so I'm not going to go into too much detail, but there's definitely a, 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 an essay in here where I talk to ab about our conversation with Omega Jones. And the backdrop of that is the turmoil that was going on in 2020 here in the United States and how uh, he was able to use both his power of performance and the forum that he had on Twitch to be able to talk through some of the the pain and hurt that black people and people of color were feeling in America uh, during that time and in the D&D community and, and shining a light on that and how the D&D community can continue to grow and change. Tanya DePass, when I talked to her back in 2016, that was just a light on kind of switch moment for me where I'm like, huh, we can invite people who may have felt excluded in the past to Dragon Talk and not make that the topic of the conversation, but just just talk to them about their love of Dungeons and Dragons and what it meant to them and the memories that they forged around the table and, and things that they hope to see going forward and things that we want, you know, you know, so the topics were always there on the surface, but they ended up changing a lot of what's going on. And, and that I can look to that interview as something that has uh, had a huge impact on me, both professionally and personally going forward. But the one that I also really like, and maybe this would be great for folks who are listening in the UK is Rufus Hound. Uh, the oh, interview wow. that we did with him, uh, in 2020. So this was in the pandemic era and he is a performer. Uh, he is a great storyteller and he took us on a journey during our interview that I don't think either of us expected Shelly, where he was talking about yeah. his struggles with uh, personal struggles with being separated from his wife and his family during that time, as well as his dependence on alcohol. And none of those things really came to light until he started playing Dungeons and Dragons and he had created something that, in his words, had created so many layers from his subconscious mm. so that his subconscious could tell him he needed to get help. And throughout that con that whole story, Shelly and I were just along for the ride. And by the end of it, all three of us were, were in tears at the power that this ostensibly silly game that involves rolling <laughs> math rocks and slaying dragons... <laughs> But it, it it touched something profound within him and just being able to share that with our podcast listeners and now in this book is is something that I think was really impactful. Thank you, guys. Yes, it's a testament to the game that it it can be a silly little game with math rocks, <laughs> like for sure. <laughs> and that's I've, fine. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I've done it <laughs> almost weekly. Um, but then also you can have it all the way at the other end of the of the scale where it is this you know, can be this profound light bulb engaging moments. And that's what I like personally for me as the kind of person that I am. I like delivering training and helping people learn and better themselves. And I love the, that, that light bulb moment. But I remember, I remember very well when my current game, which is now online, but we, we started in person and having mm -hmm. those, oh, we can, we can do that. <laughs> that that's a yes. thing that we can do in this game i was like that's that's why i'm here that's why i'm here for five hours <laughs> that's yep. oh yeah that, that's that's made me very happy <laughs> and having that light turn on when they're adults is one thing that's really mm -hmm. amazing because you're like oh there's there's a freedom of gameplay there that they that they may not realize but then having that moment with a child mm. uh yeah. experiencing that moment like gosh there's nothing there's nothing better than that because they can truly express themselves in ways that they are not able to in their lives generally, right? Mm -hmm. And and then have a community support them and cheer them on 
or groan in failure if they mess mm-hmm. something up right together or laugh at, at, at what's occurring. Like having an audience that is generally got your back is one of the one of the beauties of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. OK, so one of the things that I wanted to talk about, we're going to we're going to shift tracks for a second here and I want to bring it into the into the game. This is a, this is a question that I've asked uh, previous guests on similar topics. When you're making a setting or doing some homebrew or building a world, however you want to call it, what's the best way to build communities or the most realistic way to build communities in those worlds to have it not just be, if this is the kind of game you want, not just be a dungeon delve or not just be a two-dimensional you walk around like superstars all the time, you know, <laughs> what are the, what are the, I know, and obviously if that's the game you want, then that's totally fine. Please go ahead. But on those other games where you, you want that kind of, you want to breathe life into a world, what are the kind of tips and tricks or ways that you've picked up on or, or maybe even use yourselves of building a, a settlement or a political setup or some other, you know, village community, for example, of trying to emulate those complex systems i think it's fair to say when it's Mm. just one poor dm that's (laughs) meant to be delivering those systems well i think it's not easy but (sighs) the way that i go to it is not to create uh, you know not to go into it thinking like i'm going to create a community it's Mm -hmm. more about creating characters and Mm -hmm. how they interact with each other but that's as you said that is difficult to do when you're playing each one of those characters, right? So I think I've done this in the past and I and I would never suggest doing it again, but having like a town meeting as a DM and, and having the adventurers be there is awful, uh, at least for me. <laughs> um, because you have, to, you have to talk to yourself, basically. You have to yes. be like, well, I think we should do this. Well, I think we should do this. And in some ways, you end up having like these, these weird, like, uh, am I schizophrenic? Or yes. is this even coming across in a way that gets together? And so I try to make it all bounce off of the characters, the player characters, right? So if you create a town, Anything is a reflection of what the player characters are doing. And so it can be satisfying. And something I did a lot when I was a kid was like, oh, I'm going to I'm going to build this village and there's the blacksmith and there's the innkeep. And this is what their you know stats are, because uh, I was very obsessed with what the stats of townsfolk were mm-hmm. when I was a kid. It was something that I just really <laughs> enjoyed. Oh gosh, um, yeah. But that's not necessary. It really isn't. And that's something we have learned and talked about a lot uh, with other dungeon masters is that that sense of over preparation can make you feel like you're, you're creating something, but the hard part is still, how are you going to present that to your player characters? And it doesn't become real until that happens, right? You can make as many notes as you want about that. The innkeep has a 12 strength, but <laughs> it, unless that really comes out in play, it's not true in, in the mm-hmm. world of the game uh, quite yet. And so I've gone much you know, the other w- direction where I improv almost all of those details, right? So I'll have, I'll have outlines of like, okay, they, this person could maybe do something and this person could maybe do something if the player characters want to go talk to them. But I've moved away from, from creating that map of, you know, this is this building, this is that building and who lives there because it oftentimes either doesn't go the way you want, the way you envisioned, and then you can get frustrated as a DM because it's not being presented in the way that is the platonic ideal of how you wanted this village to be presented. Or B, you make up all that stuff and then they just burn the village down. And so yeah. you don't have to <laughs> all those people that you loved and carefully yeah. crafted, uh, you know, get attacked by the goblins and the player characters fail to save them or something, right? And you're just like, oh, okay, well, that was, you know, <laughs> that was a lot of hours of wasted. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so... I, I like to do it all through through the performance and in the in game itself, honestly, and then take the notes and have them stay consistent through then. Mm, it's that it's that bell curve meme of like the novice being like, I don't do it because I don't know what I'm doing, and then the top of the bell curve is I'm I'm gonna stat block everything to so then back at expert level where it's like I don't need to do it because I know it's not gonna be <laughs> it's just <laughs> it's not gonna be even worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Might not get used. What about yourself, Shelley? Any uh, nuggets of wisdom? Well, I am a very very green novice dungeon master so the <laughs> idea of creating anything on my own is terrifying so i'm i'm very much reliant on published mm-hmm. adventures and in, in content but i have had the pleasure of talking to a lot of dungeon masters on dragon top and i think 
that some of the best advice I've heard kind of related to this is to give players something familiar and or something mm-hmm. that something that matters in their real lives and to use that as kind of a way to get them invested in the story and they'll become invested in the characters. And I think that that by itself helps foster a community feeling as well. So mm-hmm. just kind of I, when I played with kids, I introduced the neighbor kids to Dungeons and Dragons. I d- had them, their adventure started at their school because that's where they feel the tightest community, that that is their community. And they, I had their principal ended up being their quest giver. And I think that, that they were very invested in the story because their community was at stake. There, mm-hmm. there was something that, that could potentially happen to their school if they didn't succeed on their quest. So I, I think they, I hope at least that they had <laughs> felt that community because I used their actual community. I mean, you got to add a little reality with your fantasy sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> firstly, <laughs> I was going to say when you were talking about the principal, was, he's either going to be the quest giver or the big bad. Oh, I didn't right. know which way you were going to say that. <laughs> I do not want, I am terrified of this woman. I do not want her. <laughs> She should not know. Oh my gosh, that, that story painting <laughs> her in a her. bad way. <laughs> oh, so you're you're making me the big oh, bad guy? <laughs> so I hear I'm a goblin, huh? <laughs> no, you're the you're the queen of the goblins. It's the, <laughs> it's it's much the better. difference. Yeah, it's much better. <laughs> <laughs> she is. She's a very good NPC. In fact, like she she knows when something is not on the up and up and she'll just like appear mm. once we we brought our foster dog to drop our son off at school and dogs are not allowed on the blacktop and i swear it like one tiny little chihuahua fingernail may have touched the blacktop <laughs> and she was like poof get that dog away from the blacktop I'm like how did she do that and my son was <laughs> like she teleports she can teleport <laughs> she's just uh-huh. everywhere yes so uh. very inspired <laughs> I love those kind of like elements of canon that children make for their real world. I that's know. like, yeah. oh, that's like, like she teleports. That's very matter of factly. Like, yeah. duh, everybody knows yeah. she teleports. How do you not know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, the follow up to that, then, it might be a slightly a redundant question, but as we said before, DD typically nine times out of 10 ostensibly is a a fantasy quote unquote game. So how important then do you think is it to anchor some or all or elements of it in reality? And if so, where would you sit on that, that scale, like just one or two kind of lodestones that people can relate to, or maybe have a whole, like the setting be the school, for example. I know we're kind of digressing a little bit here, but that's my, Prerogative. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's your show. <laughs> you take it where you want. <laughs> I think it's only, well, I might say only. I think that in the, the few times that I have DM'd for people who are brand new, it, it worked well mm-hmm. because it, it can be hard to just be like, you're off in like this magical, strange world that you have absolutely no ties to, mm-hmm. no context, no nothing. And it helped ground them a little. It just gave them something to like cling to as they were getting their feet wet with it. Now all of a sudden I'm an elf and I can mm-hmm. do magical things. And what is role playing? So it, it helps in that regard to just, just give them a little bit of grounding. I don't know how important I kind of like it when a dungeon master will weave in something that's a little familiar to me, but I don't know that it's, it's entirely important i don't know where i would fall on the scale i think i would i would go higher on the scale if it's for for new people who have mm-hmm. zero background in what dnd is yeah i would definitely agree with that the good example the, the answer for every dnd question is it it depends i love that <laughs> yeah. well it depends depends on the dm depends on the group yeah yeah, and I've I've heard of people who are have used that to introduce to new players too, mm-hmm. uh, even you know as adults because it does feel like oh all right there's there it's it's an easing into the playing pretend, mm-hmm. yeah um, because what can feel uh, extremely high barrier for for folks is that like well I don't know the entire history of the Forgotten Realms I don't know yeah. 
you know, the political uh, uh, landscape here or what's right and wrong in this fantasy world. But, you know, if you have a little bit of, of context and, you know, an apocalypse happening at a, at an office, I've heard people have run it like, Oh, like there's a, you know, you're just in your, like if you've done an office game, you know, people are just in their cubicles and then the zo- zombie apocalypse breaks out and then people are like, all right, what do we do in that situation? Oh, you're the guy who's got the keys to the storeroom. So we go to, to his desk first because that's <laughs> where we'll get the most weapons we need to, to fend off the zombies. Mm. But one thing I really like about how the D&D community has shifted is, this is kind of tangential to your, to your question, but it's something that popped in my brain, which was how real world community building tactics has been incorporated within D and D play. And the thing that comes to mind is things like session zero and mm-hmm. checking in and yeah. X cards and, and uh, allowing for a free flow of communication, which has the same root as community between the players and the DMS, right? Where I think in the past, you, you might just get into a game because it was the only game you had available to you at your local game store, and there were not these tools or expectations set in place, and you might end up being in a situation that you didn't love and didn't know that you weren't going to love it. But having that open flow of, I, I want to play a game like this, I don't want to play a game that has these elements, and normalizing that, which has happened in our, in our actual communities and, and has allowed our actual communities to grow and include so many more different groups. I love that that is now a big part of, of, of D&D play and so that people can continue to use those things that work you know, good in our, in, in our world to make sure that the, the play is governed by the same kind of rules of decency and just happiness. Yeah. Thank you for bringing up that Session Zero stuff because it just made me think that that is a very good example of something that's almost been like organically refined through the D&D community, through the thousands of games that people use it in and then report back to their their social communities and be like, oh, X didn't work, but then I tried Y and that was a lot better. And then now going forward, I'm going to use Y a lot more in my games. And that that kind of stuff. So very, you can almost track like the genesis of Session Zero from almost non-existent to now this very refinable thing that, that keeps getting better. And what I really liked, I saw something recently that was saying someone's going to a, a con a convention and they're going to be running games with drop in and drop out strangers, essentially. Goodness me, how do I do, <laughs> how do I do a, a game and, and a session zero in that situation? And they were just flooded with do it like this, keep it light, keep it quick, you yeah. know, focus on X, Y, Z, bish, bash, bosh, done. And I was like, oh, that's really cool that it has that dynamic ability specifically for a session zero, but also that everybody just jumped in. And as I said earlier, this didn't work or won't work for this particular situation. It depends, uh, but this does work. <laughs> so you should use this. And that I was like, oh, that's, that's super cool. And that person is now going to go on to this convention, build their community with the tools they've grabbed from their other community so that, that was a really swell interaction to to see uh <laughs> and it's something that i mean that's that's a really kind of interesting point which i don't think we've made before which was those, those things have come from the community it came mm. from people who found you know a need in how to set up more games because you know it's great the the audiences for playing these types of games has grown and so you get more people involved and mm-hmm. those standards I think we had them on Dragon Talk, right? Where we spoke to uh, Kiana Shaw and some other folks about uh, safety tools back in, I want to say like 2017 or 2018. And then those became part of the D&D books that we published. I think in uh, Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft, we can mm. specifically call out lines and veils and and how to to have those kind of conversations as well as Session Zero is now mentioned in Dungeons and Dragons manuals as something that is vital to how... Uh, you can run a successful game as a dungeon master. And those came from everyone who was playing this game and found those needs and published their own tools for them. And then we highlighted on Dragon Talk. We don't really talk about it in the book itself, but the fact that Dragon Talk can operate a little bit faster in a way to introduce concept like this to uh, the greater D&D audience, I think is a testament just to how the speed of communication has increased. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I've mentioned it on the show before and one thing that I've realized playing with my six uh, six players now five who they all started as colleagues uh, and most of us have quit that job and now we work in different jobs but we all started working together for however many years <laughs> so you know you're, you're seeing that person you're interacting with them one was my 
direct boss, my direct line manager. So very close Amazing. relationship with that guy. Even still into the game, something came up that I, fortunately, and this is a testament to, this is why I'm sharing this anecdote, because we should have done more up front. Something came up that I was like, oh, it, it was about, uh, you know, some, ch- some children. It wasn't great for them. <laughs> I'll, keep it, I'll keep it light. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, and then I was like, oh God, I don't, I don't have children and it's going to affect somebody who does have children differently. Yeah. And that's, that was when yeah. my own internal light bulb moment was like, oh God, because I have no frame of reference for that because it's not something that I have any experience with at all. I was like, oh, that's going to affect somebody differently. And that's when I, that's when I was like, there, there it is. There's the value. Boop. I can yeah. spot it <laughs> and I can point it out. I always like to say everyone should learn from my mistakes. That's my vehicle is to be like, people learn, learn from yeah. me, mate. <laughs> we used to watch, uh, uh, when I was, you know, in a teenager, the movie train spotting was a very, mm-hmm. you know, harrowing story of heroin addiction and all that. And we mm-hmm. were watching it once when we had just had kids. Uh, my wife was watching cause she had to do a Scottish accent for a play that she was in. And so she was trying to like, oh yeah, we'll watch this and try to emulate some of what they're doing. And then we had to like, nope, we are noping out of this movie because we have a <laughs> newborn and this cannot. Yeah. And, I, and that type of thing where you don't even, sometimes you don't even realize when those things are happening beforehand. Mm-hmm. So that's why it's good to have the session zero and kind of create those. But then that's, yeah. it's really important to have that ability to X card out of, of, of anything that you need to when it's mm-hmm. happening and having the social framework for that. Yeah. Yeah. I had, um, uh, just this just happened recently. I'm playing in a spelljammer campaign with some coworkers, and we were going up against. Uh, I don't want to give too much away, but a uh, <laughs> monster, a horrific beast, but that was an animal, and um, the DM had kind of given her like a, a little bit of a personality, and I think in the book she's even referenced as Big Mama. Mm-hmm. And he was like, and that's where we're going to end. And I had like a, a reaction, like, I don't want to fight a mom. <laughs> like, I don't know. If, <laughs> why do they call her big mama? Does she have kids? Like, and then I just like got in my head and I was like, oh, I don't really like fighting animals. I just don't even, I just can't. And mm. I do it to be clear, but I don't, I have to, you know, be distancing myself from that. And he actually, he caught that. And sent me a message right after the game. And he was like, hey, I noticed you seemed a little uncomfortable about fighting Big Mama. We, we don't have to. Let me help. Mm. You can even help me come up with who you want to fight. Like, it doesn't have to be her. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Thank you. Like, that was really nice of you. And we ended up did we did fight Big Mama because she is <laughs> she is horrible. Um, and it was, <laughs> you just need to have more reason. I just to need do it. I just needed to have more context. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay, I understand like the, the reason why we're fighting. It's not just you know a, a dolphin in a tuna net, but whatever. It was like, no, she's she's horrible. Yeah, we definitely she's a menace. We have to get to get rid of her. But it was very it was really nice to to be seen in that way by my dungeon master. Mm. Shout out to Chris Lindsay. He's a great dungeon master. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Lindsay. Hey, sure you want to do that. <laughs> yeah, he's great. That is great. Awesome. And that that to me is like the definition of community, right? Where yeah. someone sees mm. someone who is, you know, uncomfortable struggling. Or, or, or struggling or hurting and just like, hey, you know, I see you. You have I'm giving you the choice or I'm giving you, you know, to for for the for the power of the group to be able to work together because we can certainly see situations and maybe even have been in situations where that uncomfortability is not followed up on and it becomes a rift. Right. And like, and, and Mm -hmm. so being able to, to have the wherewithal in in dungeon masters and to have the tools be something that is more standard and commonplace. Like, I love that. I love that that's grown and changed. And that to me is, yeah, the nature of what this book is all about, how a community Started from one thing where it was in, in the 70s when 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 DD was new and no one really even understood how much it could grow and what the power of it was. And then how, you know, de- tracing the decades of, of, of how this community has changed is to now being an introduction. Like if people who are curious about Dungeons and Dragons or, have, you know, met a few people who play and want to understand why they uh, love it so much and why they get so much out of it, I hope Welcome to Dragon Talk is, is truly just a welcome to and and the guidepost to be like here this is what the D community is all about these are uh you know the histories and the context and the, and the signposts leading up to it and then here are just 
you know, 29 amazing people who had 29 mm-hmm. extremely different stories and paths and backgrounds into playing this game and get something different out of it. And uh, I think by the end of it, people will be like, oh, you know, if they don't play D&D, they want to jump in and, and want to get in there mm-hmm. and, and, and see what that that is all about. And hopefully, you know, have a story as, as amazing to tell as the 29 that we tell in the book. Hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that that reminded me of one in in our own game that I want to talk about. That we've talked like large scale communities, you know, the vast communities of the internet, which is just you know unimaginably big, but also that 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 macro scale all the way down to that micro scale of just your own table. Yeah, and you do get to know your players either even you know remotely or whatnot. You do get to build these memes, these in jokes mm-hmm. around them, and you get to you get to build that familiarity with them. Mm-hmm. And an example from our game is one of the guys message just out of the blue and was just like oh does anyone want to go for a, a drink and it's like a random thursday night i'm like he's never he's never asked that before yeah. and it's a bit of a weird time and it was just out there there was no you know prior discussions i was like is he okay like that seems like yeah. you know just out of the blue to be like yeah. does anyone want to go for a drink i'm like oh some, something happened so i, I, I messaged in the chat and was like everything cool dude like is that any and he's like no i was have the evening free and i was like okay fine cool (laughs) (laughs) but it's it's those you know those kind of those nuances to the relationships that are built through the game even if we're we're talking for four hours and three and a half of those hours is in character you still can build those relationships with people in ways you might not have built before but yeah just something inside of me was like that seems unusual because we're not making a joke about how they've killed everybody they've met so <laughs> let me <laughs> let me just double check he's okay <laughs> that's awesome yeah and you're right you 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 build up a camaraderie with every persona of that person right whether it's their character mm. and them and then if you have a longer history with them you have oh uh, that shard of you that is the elf wizard is different than mm. this shard of you that is the you know the promiscuous bard or whatever right like i i love that you can almost name the different personalities that someone can can, can in, a, exhibit yeah precisely and uh, in fact that same player he's both of his characters it's not it's not quite that my player character died and then the next guy is like the same gar- character with a mustache drawn on it's not it's not that <laughs> that bad but there is definitely a thread through his player characters that's like oh we knew somebody who had similar views on you know not killing all the bad people we come across and you know talking to them for a change and that's that's quite sweet to see to see that those facets of people that you would never otherwise yeah. see before well my, my last thing is i want to talk about the communities online and we can talk social networks and that kind of stuff so i just wanted to get your thoughts on the D D communities on the various social networks and i'm trying to be as again politically agnostic as possible in that you know each each have their own pros and drawbacks <laughs> but in terms of like the types of communities and how they differ across say you know reddit twitter and facebook and now a discord and i'm discord is i'm gonna sound old but i don't really understand it in terms of communities <laughs> like <laughs> i grew up on msn right like yeah, <laughs> with the nudge button that was me that was my ims and now you can like play golf on, on an im so it's that's that's yeah. <laughs> but in terms of like social networks and I, I guess the power of social networks and how perhaps other you know dnd creators out there can leverage those to build their own communities i guess from your your experience spread across those verticals i think we, it's fair to say how can we yeah leverage those social networks and those communities within those those unique communities within those social networks to become better not to be profound to say better humans but at least better dnd players <laughs> i found myself on reddit a lot this past weekend because i wanted tips on how to run the wild beyond the witch light for new people and i find can be a really wonderful D and D community. There, there was so much content. <laughs> there were <laughs> people go deep. Uh, you can find as much or as little, and whatever topic you want, there is going to be a subreddit for that very, mm. very topic. It's quite amazing. <laughs> I really like what people are doing on TikTok around D and D. I think there's some very mm. fun D and D content there, especially for new players. I think. People are doing cool stuff on TikTok in like teaching D and D in like these really bite-sized little chunks or demystifying some parts of it. So um, mm-hmm. very excited to see that community growing like crazy there. 
and I, I we've kind of touched on this a little, but when people ask sincerely, um, you know, advice on how to run this or how do I introduce a kid or something, there will be hundreds of people coming to your aid. And uh, one of the my most fond memories of social media is somebody had asked just a random, like, I want to play d and I have no one to play with. Mm. And so many people responded to that thread with, I'll play with you. Hmm. Here, what do you, what do you want to know? Or I'll show you the, like, I'll teach you. And, or maybe they had even had an experience where they tried to learn and people were like, no, we're not going to teach you. Or there's no, mm. like they were turned away for some reason. And they were like, I really want to do this. What do I do? So many people came to this person and was like, let's sign up together. Let's play in a virtual play weekend. I'll be your dungeon master. I'll be your, I'll be in the party. I'll do this. I'll do that. It was overwhelmingly positive and it just warmed my heart to see the community come together and just really show like a D&D party. They are there. They support each other. They want to have more people who are in this hobby because that's just more people to play with. So I think all of our platforms have the potential there, but I, now I can't remember what your question was. I just got so <laughs> overwhelmed and excited about thinking about the positive things. I try to stay on the positive side of social media when it comes to this stuff, but there is definitely wonderful, welcoming communities that will be waiting for people mm -hmm. on the various platforms. Yeah, and I'll, I'll second all of that. I will say yes. And one of the things that I love about social media is funny because I, I have definitely heard people say like, oh, Twitter is the hellscape or these, you know, these, that uh, website is terrible and everyone's like uh, awful. I had the opposite experience where I've just curated my space to be positive, supportive people within the D&D community mostly. And that has done wonders towards my mental health online platforms. Uh, and so I think it, I just like to say it is possible out there to to block the people who you think are are bad actors and uh, lift up the people in your community, respond to the people that you uh, respect and or are espousing the type of things that you are also a believer in. And you can still have a, a really vibrant uh, community in, in social media out there. It is possible. You can do it. And I would just want to secondly say that the amount of content that is now out there around Dungeons and Dragons, like on TikTok, like on Twitch, even on the more text-based social media platforms out there, what it has done is allowed people to find an ideal game for them out there. And what I mean by that is back in the 80s, you might say like, hey, I want to play D&D. &D. And there might have been only one group who is playing Dungeons and Dragons in your town or in your uh, local gaming store. And that might not have been the best experience. You might have gone to it and there weren't all the lines and veil stuff that we were talking about and you might have had a shitty D&D &D experience and might have bounced off of the game because of that. You were like, all right, well, I tried D&D, &D, it isn't for me. Now, because we have so much content available to people before they even start playing, they have more of an understanding of what to expect and more importantly, what type of game might appeal to them more than others. So say, oh, I really love uh, horror and the, uh, the DM is running fantasy, like high fantasy, and that's, they're not any horror elements at all. Well, they're like, well, I don't really want to play that game. I want to play a horror game because that's what I, I really latch on to and I think that I really like. And people will continually find the, the type of game and the type of content that they want to consume. And that alone, that power of choice I think has increased exponentially the amount of people who are getting into D&D &D because they realize it's not just what is happening at your local game store or you know a bad experience you might have had at a convention in 1982, right? There is so much more out there and uh, the menu is rich and I love that social media has provided that. Yes, amazing. Thank yeah, I, I completely agree. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for today's discussion. Is there anything that we that you wanted to talk about that we haven't quite hit yet or had the opportunity to uh, on the topic of community? I think just get people in. Like that's what's so exciting about yeah. this is that it's uh, there's never been a better time to get into Dungeons and Dragons because of this uplifting community that surrounds it, as well as the many opportunities to play whatever type of D and D fantasy game is your 
genre of choice from more sci-fi tinge stuff to uh the Feywild stuff that Shelley was mentioning to mm-hmm. you know straight up swords and sorcery like there's just so much out there that uh, people are doing and creating and there's a wealth so join and really know that D&D is uh something for everyone like to just to add on to what Greg said no matter who you are what your interests are I definitely didn't think that I would be into a game like D&D because I'm not a traditional fantasy genre fan and yet there is so much here to love and a big part of that is of course being part of this amazing community but no matter what there is a place for you at somebody's table so get out there and try it roll that d20 and watch your life change (laughs) (laughs) absolutely the barrier to entry now is like on the floor i like i know i know people say there is there is a cost up front but there i don't think there is because you have so many passionate people out there in the community who as you said earlier on are just willing to be like i'll play i'll let me let me let me be your guide through this <laughs> through this yeah. lovely hobby it's mad like and and just to put a nice little pin on it is two of my colleagues from that game they were originally like yourself Shelley. like what fantasy that's that is lord of the rings and that's it that's to them yeah in fact i don't even think one of them had seen even that and then <laughs> wow. they, they've they've gone from from that to now like oh i want can i do this with my character and oh yeah the, the the tribal chieftain of my you know my home tribe is i want him to be like this and he's gonna and this this that, and the other and they're all spinning out these wonderful yarns that i'm it's so happy to be able to build into the story to see that progression is is amazing and they've they've again it's because of that ba- that barrier to entry is so low so i i completely agree uh, that now is a good time <laughs> to join it's working it's working <laughs> working yeah and if you want to get people into the community without having to do it all yourself well that's what this book i think can can be a really great guide it's not super long welcome to dragon talk it's available everywhere. I'm going to go right into uh, pitching mode, if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, <laughs> go, go ahead. Uh, you can get it from uh, University of Iowa Press website. You can pre-order right now. Um, it's available officially on December 5th, but if you pre-order, you can get copies. I have friends. Like uh, officially, um, yes. Yeah, uh, have who gotten. have already gotten uh, uh, copies of it. We're also recording an audio book, uh, which will be available uh, soon after December 5th, uh, that will have us on microphone talking uh, through and and, and uh, performing these essays and the introductions uh, as if you were listening to the podcast itself, which is super fun. Um, so yeah, it's a great gift, I think, out there for people who are D&D fans already, or maybe even listeners of Dragon Talk. But I think it's an even better guide to folks who are D and D curious and want to learn more. And, uh, you do uh, a really great service, just following along some of the stories of the people that are uh, in the essays in this book, as well as, you know, of course, listening to dragon talk each week as we interview more and more people in the community. Awesome. D and D curious. I'm going to use that. I've not heard that before, but I'm going <laughs> to, <laughs> that's going to be my tagline. The next time I coerce my colleagues into playing with me, that will be the subject of the email. I think. It's... Are you D and D curious? <laughs> mm-hmm. So yes, just in case, Jelly, is there anything you wanted to add on to the end of that? Greg says it beautifully, but I do think it's also important to note that even if you've never listened to an episode of Dragon Talk or you have never played D and D, I think that you will still find something in this book to enjoy because it really is about people's personal experiences and just i think they're 29 of some of the most fascinating people that we've had the pleasure to talk to amazing well in which case all the links to everything everybody's mentioned will be in the episode description as per usual otherwise all that's left to say is one final thank you greg and shelley very much for today's conversation it's been heartwarming heartfelt earnest and empowering as well in a weird way so thank you very so much guys oh thank you it was a pleasure to be here i love all of those adjectives thank you i'm I'm full of superlatives me that's my (laughs) that's my (laughs) shtick i like it i support that part of being a dm right is is the uh (laughs) being able to have the the thesaurus like uh yeah exactly absolutely well in which case then all that's left to say is uh thank you all for listening and good night
And now it's time for the Patreon shout outs. Thank you to Joe from the Fourth Leg podcast. Again, two time guests of the show. And the Fourth Leg is a TT RPG podcast all about giving new GMs a leg to stand on. Please go and check them out at the Fourth Leg on Twitter. Thank you to Optional Rule, a two-time guest of the show and a very insightful and knowledgeable source of information. Please check them out at www.optionalrule.com. Huge, huge, huge thank you to a great friend of the show, Matthew Perkins, who's out there making hilarious and educational Dungeons & Dragons content. Please go and check out his stuff at matthewperkins.net where you can find links to all of his socials and all of his content, including his own Patreon, which I would very much encourage you to check out. Thank you to Matt Street at MPStreet88 on Twitter for supporting the show. If you need support running your personal or business schedule, head to virtualtimehustle.com or on Instagram to make that difference between should do and done. Boss it better with support from Kat, who will help you get back that essential time you've been searching for. If you would like to support what we do and get four shout outs a month, head over to patreon.com slash thinkingcritically, or you can just buy me a coffee at ko-fi.com slash thinkingcritically.